Oh, um, well, I am very, I'm delighted to have Melody here with me um, for the first of my interviews as part of writer in residence um, at Maynooth. And I'm just going to introduce her here. Um, Melitu Uche Okore is a Nigerian born Irish author and member of the Arts Council of Ireland. Her 2018 short story collection, This Hostel Life, was shortlisted for the Sunday Independent Newcomer of the Year Award at the Irish Book Awards. And it was adapted into an operatic work by the, Na the Irish National Opera. She was born in 1975 and obtained a degree in English before leaving Nigeria. Melitu moved to Ireland in 2006 with her infant daughter and lived in the direct provision system, which is when she began writing. She has an MPhil in creative writing from Trinity College, and her work has been published in LIT Journal, College Green Magazine, and Dublin, 10 Journeys, One Destination. In an essay entitled, Asylum Seekers, Refugees, and the Slow Path to Justice in Ireland, Liam Thornton says, in this hostile life, Okori introduces us to the system of direct provision from the vantage of those subject to this system. We are immediately drawn into the mundane, the admittedly playful sense of community, the everyday, but also into something quite alien, the limbo of direct provision and the sense that it is never quite home. There is waiting, lots of waiting, waiting for a decision, waiting to be provided with basic provisions for living, waiting for someone to tell you when you can eat and what you can eat, subject to the whims of the manager. This hostile life provides a deeply troubling picture of how Ireland treats people who seek protection. Um, and I first read um, this, uh, this hostile life when it came out and I was just I think I, I was so blown away by it, uh, Melody, which I, I've said to you, and I think you're probably tired of me saying that to you every time I meet you. I'm like, I love your work. Um, but um, I felt like it, you know, it was, I mean, the writing was so beautiful. And I suppose I also felt like it offered such a unique experience, um, you know, in, uh, such a unique insight into the experience of being a migrant woman um, in this country. Um, and yeah, just such, you know, fantastic storytelling as well. Um, so I suppose this is such, you know, this is the question that like every writer gets asked, but I am interested because, you know, I'm always asked, oh, did you always want to be a writer? Um, and actually, when I was younger, I wanted to be an actress. So I suppose, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about your childhood and like was, did you love books? What books did you read? Like was was writing, you know, a part of your childhood in Nigeria? Ah, that's, I loved books. Yeah. You know, I loved reading. I never thought I would be a writer, though. That was just so far of my imagination, you have no idea. I, I, like if, if I was told at probably a young age, say even the age of 12 to write what you want to be uh, when you're a little bit older, I, I don't think writing would have made it in any way. You know, I, I don't think so. You know, um, I would have written everything else, probably becoming an actress, becoming a, a dancer, becoming anything else, but <laughs> not a lawyer, you name it. I would have, you know, thought about it. even, yeah, you know, I, I would have even, you know, like, try to trick myself if, if into thinking that I could have become a doctor, but then I wouldn't have put in, you know, writing. But I love to more money as a doctor, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, well, I, but I love to read. I love literature. And uh, when I went into, I, I studied English literature mm. at um, uni. And I, I do remember because one of the courses that we had to take was African literature and African women's writing. And I do remember that that was when I said taking notes. Like, I think some of the, the things I read then say, you know, staying more with me. It's not just, um, you know, something you read at class and you drop it, but you carry the stories with you. Mm -hmm. I actually remember having this conversation just, I think it was yesterday with my daughter. Yeah. And she was telling me about a story that she read and how she, she gave it, someone lent her the book and how she gave it to everyone to read. She was, you know, passing it around until the owner of the book was like, can you just stop giving my book out to people? Like, I just come across it and I see them holding this book. And um, she told me that how that book stayed with her for a really long time. And she told me the story immediately. Uh, and I said, it was the same with me. I remember reading Nadal El Sadawi, it was just a kind of similar story, but, you know, and uh, and that it stayed with me, women at point zero, you know, about this woman that was experiencing domestic violence and it stayed, you know, you just carry the weight of that story, 
we see you everywhere you go. It was just, that's just the thing about books and reading and literature, you know, that I loved. I, I, I've always loved reading. I've always loved books. So, um, yeah, uh, but never, I don't know what I would have become, but it wasn't something that I thought I would have, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah. It wasn't something that I, I consciously went, went into. Yeah. I think there's something about isolation or probably home loneliness or homesickness or whatever way nostalgia whatever it is that comes to someone and you know you just wonder uh, I think that was what happened to me at some point mm. that I wanted to that made me start writing and would there have been a would there have been a tradition of like storytelling at home like you know would, would that have been something in your family yeah oh my mom loves telling you know she would have told us lots of stories you know as as kids you know all those um uh fairy tales and you know the way there's this kind of african way of storytelling that she my mom was very good at that so she would you know say yes that would have been the case but i i don't think i ever put the two together in terms of storytelling i never related the storytelling to writing you know it was more oral for me and, you know, I, I, I know how to tell good stories as well, you know, so, um, yeah, uh, would have been one of those, I would watch a TV show, I would, you know, go back to school and I would tell my friends the same, everybody watched it, but there's just something about, oh, we have to wait until I come in, you know, everyone waits until I come in the next day to retell the story <laughs> of what we watched the nights before, you know, so yeah. it's just that kind of way, yeah. so, but I, I didn't put the two together, it wasn't something that I thought I could, you know, I mixed at yeah. all but um, yeah here we are and when you say that your mother like the way that she told the stories was a very african way of telling stories like what how do you see that oh this uh we have um there's always this there's this program um as, as a, i think a lot of people who were born in nigeria would remember this tells that moonlight uh, this was what this was the the show at the time and what it was that children would sit on the ground you know near let's say an open um fire you know uh, cooking fire and then the, the, there's uh, an, an older an elderly woman or elderly male would tell them stories and you know as the, they're being told the stories you know the, the animation of the story will be showing somewhere so you follow the story of the animal it's usually about the animal kingdom you know so that I remember every time in the evening everyone sits down to watch tales by moonlight because that was the so it was just that that way the same format like, yeah. you know we remember growing up your parents would tell you stories of um usually in the evenings you know when the moon is out to tell you stories about the animals the lion the these the that the, so you carry those stories it was always a form of entertainment and sometimes you have an adult that are very good at telling those kind of stories and you have you know so my mom was quite uh good at that you know she 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 and she would have picked that up from her own side of the family so it kind of ran in the family that way but, yeah yeah. yeah, and she passed it on to you then. Um, well, I don't, I don't know in that sense, probably, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't think of it that way, but now, yes, I do. Yeah. And like when you talk about your journey to becoming a writer, like were you writing in Nigeria um, or was that something that kind of only happened when you came to Ireland? You know, I suppose, like, what was that process like? I never wrote in my, not in the sense, apart from essays at school, mm. you know, um, no, never until I came to Ireland. That's the only time I'll say that I wrote a story. I mean, wrote a story. I, I think with my with my studies, there was we had an option of either doing um, uh, creative writing though, or doing something else. I think it was something in um, in uh, linguistics as an option, you know. And I took linguistics. I didn't even take creative writing. That was how crazy it was. Like it was far out of my imagination that I would, you know, write. It wasn't something I, 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 I had any, you know, I didn't even, I knew there were writers, but they were far out of my, the, the kind of people that I related to, you know. So it wasn't something that I thought I would be, you know, that I would become or that I would uh, aim to, you know. Yeah, yeah, probably if you had asked me about would I have wanted to become a rap star or something, probably yes, I would have, yeah. said, I would have been, that's very likely, you know. Yeah. And so you were you were in Ireland and what kind of, you know, I suppose what inspired you to, to start writing when you were here? I don't know what it was, really. I think probably the people that I was with when I was in direct provision, probably the environment, probably was just the, you know, sometimes life puts you in a place where you just keeps you, you're just still. You know, that's the you're just a, a lot of people say writing during the pandemic. It's just like everything comes to a stop, you mm -hmm. know. And I think something about that 
may miss typewriting. So sorry, something about the quietness, they just not, you know, not just, just resting, the brain just stops uh, in a way, start functioning a different way. And I said, thinking about stories and coming up, but I didn't even know what to do with the stories that I had in my, in, in my head or were just things that were happening in my mind at the time. Until I said it to a friend and she said, write it down. And she was an Irish person, you know, an Irish and she said, write it down. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, that's, that's like you too. I can actually, you know, put these things down and that was it. Um, but yeah, that wouldn't have even known what to do with it. See, yeah. she hadn't made that obvious comment to me, yeah. you know. Well, your, your first story, um, which was uh, Gathering Thoughts, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, which which won an award. So, Bella, too, like you were really starting <laughs> on a high there, you know. I was, I wasn't, because I wasn't expecting that. I, I wasn't, it's just, and she was the one that found the, 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 side, the link and she said, you know, like there's something probably to encourage me to write it, you know, to, to, to stick to the writing. And it was just, I, I can't just imagine the first, it was the first draft that I sent off and I managed to finish it the night before and send it off, you know, so it's just, just how crazy it was, but I, I, I'm thankful now, I really thank God that I did that because that was what started me on this journey to say, oh yeah, there's actually something there. And then I, you know, thankfully again, everything just, it was just, it just surrounded. I, I don't know what to call it because I went in and then the, the award was in fighting words. Yes. Yeah, and I met this circle of writers as well. So it was just, I was just inspired from there on, you know, yeah. there was no stopping. And, and tell me with, um like I'll come back because I want to talk about one of the stories in particular but let's say with um this hostile life which was um published by uh, is it Skeen or Skine is it Skeen Press Skeen Press um did like did they approach you or like how did you kind of find each other one of the one of the uh would I say the uh, one of the co-founders of Skeen um uh, Gronya has always been a friend of mine. She she was one of the people she she, she used to, she was working for an organization that was working with people who were parenting alone in um, direct provisions uh, direct provision centers at the time. So even when the organization kind of when she left the organization, she still we, she was still we still became friends. Like the friendship continued after her job there ended, and she writes as well. So we. we send each other stories back and forth. And she had always told me that she wanted to start off something, you know, why can't many voices be published, you know, da, 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 da. And it was just something that we talked about cash I, in my, in my own mind, thought it was just a casual conversation. But apparently she, she was serious about it and she eventually did something about it, you know. And she met somebody else, um, Finula, and another woman. And they, you know, it became this, team of formidable, formidable women that started off Skin Press. And they, you know, they came to me and they said, um, who would like to publish you? Mm. And I gave them uh, the stories. Uh, it's a long, it's a long conversation and a lot, like, you know, what eventually, yeah, that's how Skin Press came to be. But well, she would be someone that I've known for a while. Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's such a gorgeous book. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was the first, um, obviously the, the first story in it um, is also called um, This Hostile Life. Um, and I thought it was just, I mean, like it's, you know, I, I think um, I think Liam Thornton put it very well in that like, it's it's very, like there's real humor in it. Um, and, you know, like I suppose just, you can really, they, all of the different characters are evoked so well, but it is also, I suppose, that sense of just like, what horrific system you know it is too and like it, just even in the um the little thing uh, preceding it like your essay preceding it um where you were talking about you know just I suppose how you know the rules that you know like change all the time about like what time you're going to wake up in each morning or how much you know the quantity of washing powder for each residence um the the lunch which was usually served between 12 to 2 was changed to 12 to 1 30 well dinner which was usually served between 5 to 7 was moved to 4 30 to, to 5 30 and and this kind of sense as well of like just how tyrannical some of the staff were and how intimidating they were but also this fear of complaining you know um I just I think that really I kind of really broke my heart I think just this the the fear you know like of being like that they don't want to the the residents don't want to seem like like the troublemakers 
Um, and I remember um, years ago now, an editor told me that I should write a book um, with the main character that, you know, from um, from the perspective of a main character who was living in direct provision. And, you know, it was funny, it was, it was a long time before sort of the idea of own voices. And I still felt sort of uncomfortable with the idea. I was like, I don't really think that's my story to tell. Um, and I suppose I'd love to know kind of what you think about that. Like, do you feel that it's appropriate for other people to tell these stories or do you feel that other people are trying to tell those stories for you? I think, I, I think, I don't think it's inappropriate. However, I think that sometimes you have to understand, you have to have a rounded view of, of an issue, you know. Um, I don't think it's for anyone to tell a particular story. Um, you know, it doesn't, I, I, someone does not have to be, to be living in direct provision to write a story about direct provision or anything like that, or even living in a particular area. But I think that what happens is that sometimes if you don't have a rounded view of something and you're only looking at it from the outside, you tend to come into the story from kind of a perspective that's not, almost uh, that is not is almost um that feels I, I don't want to use the word judgmental that's that's the wrong word but it, 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 it someone can tell that you can't like I, I can tell that this is not a rounded view like all the characters I don't think there's always in any situation there's any good guy and a bad guy I don't think so I think sometimes we, humans are humans, you know. If you're working up, sometimes you come in from work. If you, if I'm, if, if I have, if I've had a shitty day at home and I come into work, I'll probably be nasty to some people, you know. <laughs> but that's, you know, but if you don't have a rounded view of me, you probably don't know that this ailing to be and that 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 you're only seeing one side of the story. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, I think anybody can write anything, but just try to make sure remove yourself and be objective, and then just have, look at it. Have, have a rounded view of the of the of the story and the people involved and all of that. Um, yeah, but I think anyone can actually. I think it's possible for you know for other people, and I think it's actually needed. You know, I think that this is a particular um, area that people are afraid to write about because they don't want to. You know, what I what I mean are the there are there are, um, there are staff that were working in direct provision, and I've not heard their own point of view or how it or, or, of how it felt or how it still feels like working in that kind of setting. Even from their own family, their children who watch their parents going into work and come home and complain. You know, so mm -hmm. it's it's not always yes. It's not, this is my my perspective, but then I to hear the other person because that would be funny as well you, mm. you understand i want to see how other people view us when we're trained yeah sometimes we throw tantrums you know so this happens okay dinner has been shifted there, must, there might have been something that made the dinner to be shifted from a particular time to time so i want to know why because that wasn't explained to me but if i read out that perspective i probably would know why that happened you know so it's all of these um yeah i i, I would love to read the the other side of the story uh yeah but then I, I think that it has to be um sometimes people do a bit of revenge writing you know oh so you wrote this about us i'm going to write this about you but that's not what it is about it's about telling you know it's about being uh honest about it honest and objective about the situation and that would always come across when that is done um yeah yeah, yeah. um and I suppose, well, I will say, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I suppose when, when I read your work, I suppose there is that authenticity there. Like, you know, it, it, it does feel so true. And I suppose that would be very difficult, I think, for any author, no matter how talented you are, I suppose, to really be able to access like that, the truth of that, unless you've sort of experienced it. Um, but um, yeah, and I mean, I, I know in the, um, again, in one of your, in your essays here, you talk about like when you, um, when you left you know direct provision you said since leaving direct provision life has been a struggle i think there should be more support for, for women parenting alone and perhaps immigration flexibility for grandparents and other family members to visit ireland to see their loved ones so i suppose i'd love to kind of get your your take on like what can be done to i mean you know hopefully direct provision will be abolished but i suppose to help maybe like you know more like I suppose integration um, and to feel like that there is more support for migrant women, but you know, both while they're in direct provision and, and after they've left. I think, I think now, I think um, recent, this, the, the new justice minister is doing quite a bit, you know, like she's, she's doing a lot. And um, 
um, there's been a lot of changes, you know, within the, the system since I left, which sometimes you, it makes you feel jealous, like, oh, why is everything going well now when, you know, <laughs> yeah, but it's, 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 um, yeah, there's a lot that is happening there now, a lot of changes, a lot of good changes still. Um, there's still some things that needs to be fixed as well. Um, I, I, what I think is that sometimes, that even now that there's a lot of clamoring for hearing diverse voices, I think a lot of the attention actually goes to people in direct provision. And I forget that there are people who have left direct provision and are now living in the communities, mm -hmm. you know, and those ones would love to to those things and uh, yeah that seems it is e I think that kind of uh, okay we're going to look after this community but there are other communities as well and I and I felt that way like every you you when you're in direct provision you seem to kind of know there's some you know like I built relationships coming out of there mm. but ever ever since I've been here it's harder within the communities to build relationships from the community I've moved around quite a bit since I, I, I left the provision. You know, I was in Adamstown, I was in Sligo, I'm back in Barbregan, you know. So all of those movements, it's harder to, to build, you know, um relationships and all of that. And that still needs to be, I I I, I needs to be looked at in terms of um there are a lot of people that are actually isolated some are some are not just you know not just I, I i know some of them are older women as well older than i am as in older uh, so there are so many things that still needs to that lead to i i don't know what i don't have the answer for how that can be fixed but i do know that sometimes it's as if that everyone thinks that once this happens it's okay your life is perfect forgetting that you've been stuck in a place for 10 years and that's a long time to fix you know that's a, I mean you think about people who've been in a particular situation for 10 years people recognize that they need a bit of time a bit of rehabilitation time and all of that that's been you know that's a, a system in itself for 10 years 11 years 30 years and this you know they come out and then you know we have this thing about Africa we're running around trying to prove that we're all strong and then after a while it just hits you you know and that happens and that that needs to be supported as well you know mm -hmm. and there's so many things even within um in, in terms of even you, you mentioned i i had my daughter here in ireland mm -hmm. and she's still not an irish citizen mm -hmm. that's the most ridiculous thing that's yeah, bizarre yeah. and yeah. it just it hurts me it hurts me you know that that is still the application is just there pending i mean it's much bigger. i know that the, they say that there's so many people applying for passports your people are you know with brexit and all of that but the, a, a particular a different department could have been set out for them to manage that particular group of people i mean it's it's that's the simplest that's the fact that they're modded up with everybody else with somebody who is in I, i'm not begrudging anyone but someone who is in, in the in the states that has, has a great grandfather you know that is just trying to i mean the fact that this is happening and these people's life have been stopped for that long yeah. is crazy yeah and that that's that sometimes it feels it feels you know it, it's just those those gray areas that just needs i mean it's great doing all the obvious things but there are this this particular thing that needs to be you know yeah. to talk and about actually that. um in under the um in the second story under the awning, um, Auntie Muna does, I'm just gonna see now because she, yeah, um, you know, I, I, I thought this was, and I'm gonna ask you to to read a part, but you know, it's the bit, I'm not sure if you wanted to read this bit, but you know, it's um, where on the television, a man was talking about how the new American president was his relative. And Auntie Muna said to your mother, that wasn't it interesting that the same people who were quick to claim this black man from America were the same people who said the black, girl from London could not be a rose of Tralee. And then Auntie Muna wondered aloud why she was even talking about the black girl from London when the African children born in this same country were not even accepted as Irish and do not hold the same passport as other Irish children. Yeah. It's just yeah, I, 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 when I write, I try to bring in, depending on what it is I'm writing about, I try to bring in what is current, you know, what is in the current political, what is the current political debate into my right? And I try to play, oh, yes, yes, it's fiction, but then I try to play around the debate, the political debate as well at the time. Mm -hmm. And at that time that I wrote that story, that was what was going on, you know, like there was this 
big uh, uh, ura about this girl from Derry that was going to compete in the. You know, I, I don't know if you remember the story yeah. when that was going to compete in the. You know the rules of Charlie and then there was a uh, you know at the same time they were rolling out the red carpet for I mean yeah Obama they were rolling out you know there was a, there's a, a building you know a plaza named you know it's just, <laughs> yeah. kind of like the most ridiculous thing you know <laughs> so it's just that kind of hypocritical you know that kind of hypocrisy going on that you're like what you know is am I the only one seeing all of these things and I I, I like to bring those things, that, that kind of outside debate and just throw that in somewhere. And I think that was what happened with the-, the Yeah, it, it worked. I'm gonna actually ask you to read a section from um, Under the Awning, um, which, but I think that works really well, that character of Auntie. Uh, uh, Muna, am I pronouncing it correctly? Is it Muna? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but I'd love it if you could read a section from that, if you, if you would be able. Of course. <laughs> Thank you for asking me to read, and thank you for this interview as well. Oh my Louise. God, I'm it's honored. I'm absolutely you. honored. Same here, same here. Uh, we have to talk about asking for it all. We have yeah, to keep no, that no, in no, 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 this is, this is right <laughs> over to you. <laughs> I have so few, okay. But it was after you met Demod that you started to write. He came to visit your mother four months after you arrived. He had been working in London for a, for a few months, which is why you had never met him. Your mother introduced him as the nicest Irish man she had ever met. He told you eagerly that he had worked with a lot of charities in Africa and also did some work with Antimona's organization. He spoke about his experiences through his work with the openness your pen pal letters used to have, which made you like him even though he was old like your mother. And your smile reached your eyes for the first time in a long while because his were not guarded. He told you he hoped to get funding to run a project, helping migrant children and teenagers to integrate through football and dance. When your mother asked him from the kitchen where she was preparing jollof rice with prawns for him, if one could be taught to integrate, you had jumped in and said you thought it was a great idea. He still responded to your mother's question and said he didn't think there were enough opportunities for people to integrate, to which your mother replied, that the church, the school, the road, the shops, and the playground should provide enough opportunities for people to integrate if they wanted to. Your mother glimpsed the look of impatience on your face and answered you back with silence. You could tell him things you could not bring yourself to tell your mother, how you hurried with your shopping because the security men followed you around the shops blatantly and about the man who got on the same bus with you from school and how he would wave and smile and you would wave and smile back until the day he told you he would give you a hundred euros if you slept with him. You had started with the small things first and then you started telling him bigger things about your father and how in your head you had blamed your mother for leaving and how you had always struggled with the anger and guilt or couldn't talk about it because the first time you tried to say something your mother had stood up from the bed and said, it always had to be about you and walked out of the room. You told him how for a long time you had felt as if all your family had died when your mother left you behind to travel with your siblings, both of whom were young enough to go with her on her passport. He had nodded his head repeatedly as if he heard the things you were saying and the ones he left unsaid, that your mother leaving you behind was her way of punishing you. He took you and your siblings to the cinema and you knew by people's reactions to you that they found it strange, the way their eyes lead away when you caught them looking. The old white couple who mumbled and scowled at him. The black man who looked at you with contempt before turning his back on you, his arms folded across his chest. The young woman with two little children who smiled at you and said too brightly, it's lovely today, isn't it? You wondered if he felt as uncomfortable as you but you couldn't read his expression. He started a conversation with a young woman, but did not include you. So you walked away to look at the suites until it was time to go in for the movie. He got the funding for his project and you went with your mother and your nine-year-old sister to watch your 11-year-old brother play on the migrant team. There were three, there were little groups formed around the pitch. The black group, two white couples that spoke to each other in a foreign language, and a large Irish group. Each group mostly ignored the other. When he came around later, he wanted to know if you thought the event was successful. 
or you dodged the question. You are yet to feel comfortable telling someone something was grand when you didn't think it was. Mm. He told you his dream would be to run more integration football and to go to schools to give anti-racism talks. You told him then about the little children down the street, of perhaps the ages of five and six, who persistently shouted blackie at you whenever they saw you walking alone and how their parents talked amongst themselves like they could not hear. He told you not to bother about them. You also told him about the girls in your college who told each other to mind their bags or made so much about their pussies being in their bags whenever they wanted to use the toilet. He told you he didn't think the girls meant anything by it. And you wanted to tell him about the woman at church who told you that a traveler woman has said that travelers were no longer the lowest class since the arrival of Africans. And you wanted to tell him about the bus driver who dropped you two bus stops away from your stop because there was nobody else apart from you two in the bus. And you wanted to tell him about the man who followed your mother to his supermarket car park and told her that he wanted a BJ and how your mother told you that she had felt bad she didn't have what he wanted until she realized what he meant. You wanted to tell him all these things, but you didn't. You cried for a long time on your bed after he left, confused at how alone you felt with so many people around you. And the next day you went into the same spa shop and you bought a diary. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, um, I thought that was a very interesting line when the mother says, you know, that there are plenty of opportunities to integrate, you know, that there's the school, there's the church, there's, you know, this place. And it's like that, that it's, it's a conscious decision, I suppose, almost that, that, that there isn't that integration. And I remember like 10 years ago, um, a friend of mine from the States came to visit um, Ireland. Um, she's a, a woman of color and, and, and I, I, she was kind of going around Dublin and she said to me afterwards, she was like, you know, I found Ireland a really racist because I, I found it very kind of, kind of confronting in that way. And, and I was really surprised, which is obviously my white privilege because, and I felt like, I was like, no, I can't, like this is sort of the land of a thousand welcomes. And like, you know, there, you know, I, 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 was, I was really shocked that that kind of was her um, experience. And I think in that story in, protect, in particular, it's sort of the, just the way in which you describe like all of the, you know, like it, it it sounds really wearying like it's like it's not just the microaggressions and the things that you're that the dermic can so sort of easily dismiss but then there's the really overt racism um and like the horrifying example of you know that that man give asking the character you know that he'd give her a hundred euro if she sleeps with him mm. and and the, and the mother you know that he asked for um a bj and i suppose over the last like i suppose particularly since george floyd's death you know in 2020 there has been kind of a reckoning um all over the world but definitely in this country as well about sort of how we treat um people of color how we treat black people um and i suppose what what do you think that like and this is i know this is a big question Melitou, but like what do you think irish people can do to sort of i suppose try and tackle you know try and tackle this issue i, I you know like that's not um it's, it's i always say that racism is a mindset thing you know and it's something that people you either buy into it or you don't, you know, it's, it, and you said it's a conscious effort. Uh, sometimes it, it's like this, let me give you a, an, ex, I don't know if this example would work, but I was thinking about it and I, I just thought about it. It's, it's like someone comes in, you, you have a, a nice, you, you've got a nice car and someone comes and just, you know, probably puts their oily hand on it, you know, and you go, there are many ways you can react to it. What I find around me is that people come in and they go, oh, there's this, someone just put an oil, an oil hand on it. And then, you know, probably they slashed the tires of the guy that put the oil hand on it. And then they call out their cousin and their cousin comes and burns the car. And then they call out their, their grandfather and their grandfather comes and punches the guy. So you get all these reactions, you have this crazy reaction, you know. And the, it could be a situation where you put an, an oil hand on, on somebody's bonnet or a brand new car and then you you know the, the owner of the car is irate and calls someone a relative and the relative says it's okay it's just an only it's gonna wipe out you know so let's let's clean up it's okay and everybody becomes friends so is your reaction to things so what I find is that there is this um nationalistic tendency right now going on like wildfire and everyone just coming in and jumping into it and everyone just coming and jumping it and everyone just hears something and they're like jumping it you know so 
and you're thinking calm down it's not as hard as i mean we and we hear stories of people dying every day and they leave all the whole fighting that they've been doing i mean you don't take your land with you you don't take your house with you you don't even take even your crazy your mobile phone is as ridiculous as that you can't even be buried with your mother mobile phone you know <laughs> as much as you clutch chips everywhere in life you're still going to leave it behind and someone else is going to access everything that is in it you know so that's that's how life is. We're not going to take anything with us. You know, it doesn't matter where you're born to and you're there. I mean, it just, it, all of those things just goes away. And that's just, so to me, I don't see the point of racism sometimes because, you know, everything is just so temporary. Everything just passes. It's just just this movement, this flow of things. So I, I don't see what it's, I don't see what the division is. I don't see why you can't, I don't see why something has to, I, I don't see why you have to be, you know, a, 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 that, that thing about that, oh, oh, she said this or she thinks or, or Louise did this, you know, why it has to stay more than even a second, you know. Yeah, we, we get angry, but we have to let it go. You know, so I, I don't see the point of, so if people just know that life is just this, this continuous movement, you know, that you can't even predict what's going to happen. And you, you make a decision today, it's all, it, everything that was done a hundred years, a hundred years ago, is there's just this conscious effort to redo all of them now. That's how crazy life is. So life just keeps moving and moving and moving and changing and changing constantly. So I don't see if, if we can just, you know, take a moment to realize that there's just nothing. That's absolutely, I mean, like, I mean, look at look at from 2019 up until this moment, we're just trying to get out of being cooped up at home out of this this pandemic or whatever the, the, the case is. And that's just how and how many people lost it, how many people were ready to give up everything. We couldn't even travel, couldn't do anything. And yet, you know, we've done everything about life has always been in putting these barriers here, there, 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 there. And we couldn't even use any of them. For, for two years, for three years, every everything that we put in place, none could be used, none could be utilized. Often buildings were left empty. That's how crazy life is. So if racism could be, that should be a lesson in itself. If we can just look at life that way and just let things go. I, I don't see the point in, uh, I don't wanna, yeah, there's so many things that the, the, the answer I'm giving you today would have been different if probably you asked me this like, last year or whatever you know but now it's just so i don't see the point in so many things that we do i don't see it but the point is so many of the nationalistic policies that are going around today because there's so much of it going on today in america and in, in ireland you know everywhere and i don't just i don't see the point in that anymore like it's ridiculous it's, it's, it's ridiculous yeah really. yeah i think we should just put that out actually kind of as a psa it's ridiculous, guys. Just, just stop. You know. Let's drop it now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm up. Um, and can't I can't even um, choose. Like kids going up, we can't even choose their friendships anymore. You know, like I can't even. I can't stay my daughter to. You know, she has. She, she's friends with whoever she wants to be friends with. You know, she's gonna. So, what's is the point of wasting all of this energy and all of that? Yet, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like, it's insane. I know. Um. And actually in that story as well, it's sort of told through um, the lens of a, of a writing group. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, a writing group that, I don't know if it would be a writing group I would like to be part of, um, <laughs> but um, I, yeah. So I'm not sure, if was, was that sort of, were you part, presumably you were part of one when you first came, I think you said that earlier, didn't you? I was, I've been part of a few writing groups. I would start and then stop. And some have been very, very, beneficial i know one that has been very very you know uh, beneficial to me and uh, i i enjoyed you know i was um, i as i told you i did um creative writing you know uh, as a master's and and i joined it i i enjoyed the interactive um you know um process or whatever uh, of the of the structure of those classes you know where you read other people's work and and that's the only time i i think i got the time to you know like i got the chance to experiment you know, just even try my hands at writing this or that because you're 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 feeding off other people or what they're bringing in, and you know, and uh, uh, I did um, I I did uh, hi Lauren, <laughs> that's your question popular. Sorry. Oh yes, well, we, we'll have a we'll have like a few minutes at the end for questions. So if anyone okay. has one, just put it into the chat box. Yeah. Or if I could to continue. 
So I enjoyed doing that. I enjoyed uh, yeah, doing the, cre the creative writing workshop. However, when, when I wrote that story, the original story, as I've said it so many times, the, the, the second the story that's in the story, the yeah. story of, of them all to the mom, the girl, and all, um, and Mona, was the story I wrote. I think it was so shocking to my, you know, uh, to my uh, colleagues at the time, this story of like, you know, saying, oh, you are, all of you are just racist, you know, so it was a bit like in your face. I've, I've learned so much since then, you know. Um, so, and uh, they weren't very enthusiastic about the story. So I had to go back to do something about it. And I thought, but I didn't want to touch anything in the main story. I didn't want to remove anything from that story. You know, I just wanted it to stay at the world. So the, only the story, the story is perfect. They were just leading somewhere. I think they were. They know. didn't want to be confronted with, you know, that sense of that they that they didn't want to be confronted with the the truth. I think, but and actually, I was going to ask you that, and I suppose I was going to say, but the truth for me is the is is the purpose of storytelling. And I'd love to know, like, what do you think is the purpose of storytelling? Like, why do you tell stories? To entertain, really, <laughs> first off. And um, I think stories has this thing that they bring, uh, okay, I'm gonna, this is a point where I'm gonna bring asking for it into it. Oh, God. You know? <laughs> what I felt was so, one of the things, I don't know if anyone has ever said that to you, but I, I did mention that when I, I met you in Galway. I thought it was so intelligent, so clever. I, I, I always find when I read something that stays with me, it's just the way you did in asking for, you know, when the girl, all the names that she was called and she keeps repeating that. You know, I asked her, I said, how did you know, to, you know, to put that in there? Because that was just so, you know, it, it's such a, it's, 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 it's a wonderful, but I can't praise, I, I, I mean, so many people have, have praised it. But for me, that part where she keeps, repeating those and that's what people don't get that when things hurt you when people say things are hurt you it stays in your head it keeps repeating itself repeating itself repeating itself repeating itself, repeating itself. so for you to have put that thing in and that was the first time I was reading something like that the way that you know the way you kept hammering you know the way the girl did that that was the first time I saw a writer do that you oh. know so I'm like I was thinking about this that's just so true and there's a, and that's what thing that literature and writing and you know when people put that out there and you think oh, I've experienced that so I'm normal you know I thought it was just me so that that means that kind of normalizes the situation for me in terms of oh so that actually does happen to people for her to know that for her to have known that to write it down that means it's something that happens to people and that was what happened with asking for it for me reading that you know that story and reading that part the way you did that there and I think for you know in terms of stories that's what stories should do for you stories should actually bring a situation a life situation into some kind of equilibrium for you as a as the reader and make you realize oh you know so this is this is this this has happened to somebody else this is happening in the world at the same time entertain you but at the same time give you you know make you realize that everything is okay i mean it's happening if the writer knows this that means it's it's, it's you know something yeah. is, is, is is common or it's, and, it's um, yeah. so, but i think entertainment one it should always entertain it should inform as well, which is what I was just trying to to, to, to say there in that roundabout way, but yeah. Um, and who are your, like, who are your favorite authors? Like who, like, let's say people who are listening now, what, what book that you've read recently that would you say, everybody has to read this book? Well, definitely asking for it. Everybody has, I'm no, sure everyone in Ireland has. No, has <laughs> no. <laughs> they should, if they haven't, they should. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many, uh, you can't, I can't, I can't name any, uh, you know, it's just, uh, just so many, I, I, I you know, I just, I'm, I'm a lover of books, I'm a lover of reading things and remembering what I've read, I, and it's funny, I, I think one of the things that people should not, if, if there's anything, I, I, I read something that someone wrote, this was years ago, someone wrote something and sent it, I'm just giving this as an example, and sent it to me, and I read it, and then, um, a few, a few recently they wrote something else concerning the same thing and they sent it to me and they had re rewritten it, you know. And I said, has this been, and I asked, has this been rewritten? And they said, oh, it's just, a, you know, just a, but I thought, oh, 
it's like I, when it comes to reading, I don't read and forget. I mean, if there's something that someone should know about me, it's that thing. Like as long as my eyes clocked on it, I would remember, you know. So it's just one of those things that I love reading. I love, I enjoy books. I take my time and it's not something that I rush to do. You know, it's not something I can just, I can watch TV show transiently. For me, reading is not like that. It's, it's like it's something I treasure and, and I read so many. Yeah, so many. I love Margaret Atwood's work. Um, I love um, Shimamanda. I love there's so many, so many. But I, I think I'm partial. I know. I'm sorry. I'm partial to female writers as well. You know, that's okay. Uh, there's know, nothing. I, I can't. You know, there's just I can't. Uh, <laughs> um, and actually, I was going to. I was going to ask. But I'm more of a of a book person as opposed to an author person. I'm more of okay. I read this of yours and I loved it rather rather than. Um, you know I follow this author does that make sense uh, yeah so. yeah no that does that does and uh I was going because because you say that you're um a book person I was going to ask you a little bit about the experience of having uh, your book adapted for an opera like are, are, is opera something that you're a fan of or you were a fan of before this or was this a very new experience are you having a laugh <laughs> <laughs> hey I, I, I'm, I'm just asking the questions <laughs> Yeah, it was a very, very new experience. And one that I, I, I got to love as well. You know, it just showed me that there's so many ways that things can be done. You know, it was just another opening of ways that things can be done. I didn't think it was possible until that happened. And I just thought, oh, there's so many ways that someone can disseminate work and, you know, get people from different, you know, listening to it or hearing it or, you know. So that for me was interesting in itself. And I, I love that that happened with, uh, with this whole still life. And uh, yeah, but it, it made me think about writing things in different ways as well. You know, that, that I, oh, that's possible. You know, that can be, that can be, there's nothing that cannot be, you know, uh, what I say, uh, played with or, you know, molded in different ways. And that, that was great in itself. But no, that wouldn't have been my, um, <laughs> not that bourgeois. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to check and um, guys, if anyone else has any questions, you can just put them into the chat box. Um, so this is a question from Lauren and she says, thank you, Louise and Melody for this discussion and welcome to Manuth uh, Melody. Um, I am interested in the idea of integration versus assimilation. As an immigrant myself, it still feels like Ireland is stuck in a retrograde idea of assimilation, which sees difference as marginal to belonging rather than integral to community. Melitu, I'd love to hear more about your experience of the idea of integration and the way it seems to presume knowledge of existing systems when everything seems always to be changing, like you say. Right. Okay, that's a, that's a good one. I think sometimes when we, we're pushed, it's, it's like there's this saying, when you, I don't know if they say it here, when in Rome, do like the Romans do, you know, yeah. so that's basically what it is. So as, be like the Romans, assimilate, be like us, act, you know. I, I, I've had some moments where I was so, annoyed by the things happening in this country. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just going to put it out there. I was just annoyed by certain things. I, I just feel that if it was possible for people to throw in a flyer into your, 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 your post box and say, this is how you act when you're living in Ireland, when you get up in the morning, <laughs> open, your, open your blinds, what are your plans? You know, like people can be that, that imposing you know they can they can get into your personal space that way yeah it's, it's incredible like if they can actually put in a flyer they would attempt it or hand it to you on the street and say you have this you know you know like zip up your coat brush your hair that way that that can be that way uh, yeah so but I, I think the best thing is and, and sometimes there's this tendency to be dismissive of other people's culture if it's not from a certain place if it's not european or american or whatever that means you have nothing good to to say or to contribute and yet you know um everyone has something wonderful to bring even a, even a baby you can learn so much from a baby just watching a baby you know on the floor and you know, so i think that i think it's just that acknowledging that someone you know has something great i think that's that's where integration works better you know you have something great you have something that you can bring uh, bring on board and that we can all learn from each other as opposed to be like me act like me talk like me you know and then if if you're not like me then i rule my eyes and that's it you, you know like i have nothing to pick up from from um the person but you know um yeah it's 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 great in that sense so yeah i i suppose there are places that are that are 
opportunities and integration is easy. It's like having a friend that's different from you or having, you know, you want, you don't want all your friends to be like you. So, I mean, kids get mad when people copy them. They go, she's copying me and he's copying me. And that's, that's, you don't want anybody else. You don't want a clone of yourself. You want someone mm-hmm. that's different, speaks differently. They, they might not do it the way you do it. They might not be as uh, articulate or, or, you know, however, but then they have something, you know, wonderful as well that they bring into the table. And it's just for people to pay attention and listen to them and pick that up and, you know. I love that. Um, and I'm kind of conscious of the time, so I'm going to start wrapping up now, but um, tell me, and I know this is the question that every writer hates, um, but I'm going to ask you anyway, Mela, too. Um, what are you working on right now? Or can you share anything? Are you sort of still in the, the early stages? Uh, you know, I just write for, for writing sake. So I just play around with ideas that come to me. And if they turn into something, you know, uh, then that I'm happy. Are you just no? Usually, you know, you ask me the question, Louis. If it's if it's a novel or a short story, I don't start off. I've tried a few times to start off things. I say, no, I'm going to write a novel, and then I end up not, you know, doing that. I hope to someday, but then right now, I think the best thing that I do is just to write and just see where it goes or how far it takes me and all of that. But what once I am enjoying now is just I, I just discovered the, the love of scriptures, you know, what I mean by biblical scriptures, verses and all of that. So I'm just toying around with the ideas of bringing it to life, to the modern, to modern life and seeing what stories I can create from there and just drawing parallels with what's, you know, stories in the Bible and then things that are happening in life. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that sounds, that's 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 incredible. Awesome hope I can do something, you know, that yeah. I can you know, share with people up to, yeah. from there. Um, we, we have a quick, that sounds amazing, Mela, too. And I'm, I'm, please let me, if you have any proofs or if you want someone to proofread it, please. Ah! Oh, you're in trouble uh, now, no, Louise. No, no, I'm sure. serious. Like, oh my God, an early look at a Mela, too, um story. I'd be absolutely thrilled. Oh my God. Oh, I'm so honored. Oh, <laughs> um, no, 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 I, I will be the one who's honored. And um, we have another question here from Catherine um, who says that she reread um, this hostile life um, this morning and she was impressed again on how wonderful it is, which I, and honestly, if anyone is listening, and they um they haven't read it yet please buy it it is just such a beautiful book um and um Catherine was saying that she's wondering where your story the egg broke came from Mm, okay right that's an interesting question I think it came from missing home though yes okay yes okay remember I think as a child I was told as I think it was a passing comment you know I think I overheard my mom talking and um, it was about we have uh, relatives that were that, that kind of were affected by the twins, the the hmm. what I call it the the what's it called the twins. Um, I don't want to use the word that, that a word, but you know what, what happened with twins at the time in my in my village and um, they were affected. Um, their parents were affected, not the ones that I, I knew, but their parents, they had older twins yeah. that um, that happened to, and you know, sometimes they say things are abolished, but then it stays, you know, people still practice it for a while before it's, it's, it goes away completely. So I, I think it was just a passing comment that my mother made that got me. And this was me as a child. So you can imagine that story coming back to me uh, uh, so many years, like decades later. And um, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to, just that little information, I'm trying to form a story around it. You know, every other thing there is just, is the idea, the concept of it that I heard, but every other thing about the story was made up. Like, I don't know what you do. I, I don't know how the practice was done, but it's just something that I heard that this happened you know and uh, to these people and that was it so every other thing that happened in the egg broke the whole sacrifice thing and all was just just imagination so mm-hmm. you know please don't yeah. quote me that that happened it happens <laughs> this way or that i don't know how you know how no, that, how no we will we'll allow you creation um, <laughs> yeah. creation license license i lo- actually i i had um i had saved that just that little section at the end because i thought the writing was so beautiful you know, I have traveled the length and width of a woman looking for them. I have entered places where women do not go. And I have entered places where humans do not go. I have walked fearlessly through great forests, 
crossed deep rivers and marched into sacred places, my breasts heavy with milk and a mix of their blood and mine dripping down my legs. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. I, I, I had a young so baby at the time, so I think I'll spill a bit uh, for more now at the time with all the marching forth and the breast milk and all of that. So I guess that's where. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's really the, the language is just oh, the writing is just so beautiful. Um, and obviously now, you know, um, I was telling you that as sort of writer in residence here at Maynooth, that I am teaching a creative writing class. Um, and it's the first time I've ever done it. Um, and it's very interesting as was having these kind of, you know, young, aspiring authors. And I would love to know what piece of advice that you would give those students or any other um, aspiring author who is um, watching today? What's the kind of the best piece of advice you have for a writer? I think just, just you know, use this time. This, this is me um, uh, being, use it, use it, you know, well, you know, uh, what I mean by well is just, just experiment. You know, this is the time of your trial and error. You know, this is a time when you kind of try to find out and build a body of work as well. Try to find out who you are as a writer, what you enjoy and whatever it is that you enjoy, do it, do more of it. Just build a body of work, you know, around that and just just let it be. Just I, I think sometimes, you know, um, around this time, people are worried about people, conversations coming about being published and all of that or, you know, getting your work, you know, um, to the wider audience. I would do, I would, if I could turn back time, I would be more protective of this time, of my time as, as, as a writer, you know, there is, I would have been more protective before the, the wider audience comes in. I don't regret this also life coming in, but then there's something about exposure and all of that, that kind of hinders your writing as well. So I'll be more protective of my time around that time and just worry about writing and getting people who, you know, that are, because every, every, advice or whatever that you get at this point is just is pure you know and and this is a time to utilize that and just you know just work on what you 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 you, you have around you and just get people who you trust to read your work and feedback to you and just experiment and just build up your work and don't worry about the publishing or whatever it is or what you're just later you know just if, if i know what i know i probably will not get published until i'm i'm done writing for life and i have this you know and then people can publish whatever you know just but but you know so i would have i would have done it differently if i know what i know and so i'll just say um protect your, your 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 space or your privacy or your 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 the process wherever you are at this point protect it and and just um you know yeah I, I would quote you. I think that's really good advice. I do. I think that's great advice. Um, and uh, yeah, Melody, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you for your beautiful work. Um, and I just can't wait to read, you know, when, you, when you're ready to share, you know, as I said, be protective of your work. But when you're ready to share, I can't wait to read what you do next. Well, another thing is something I think, Len, you know, they have the best teaching them right now. Oh, God. You as much as you want from them right now, you know, and just, uh, you know, ask as many questions and, you know, use who you have. I don't want to use the word use, but utilize what you have at the moment. Pay attention as well. I think sometimes people don't have to appreciate the opportunity that they have at the time that they have it. Pay very, very good attention to what they're saying to you and what they're doing right now. And to what I mean, what I mean is your teachers or whoever is around you. Yeah, pay very good attention. Yeah. I didn't I didn't ask her to say that in case any of my students. No, 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 but it's true. <laughs> That's true. They need to. They need to pay good attention. Right? You know, this is, a, this is a time. This is a time. Just, you know, yeah. soak in as much as you can. Thank you so much, Mother, too. Honestly, it was welcome. such a great chat. Thank you so much for doing same this. Same here. I enjoy talking to you. And uh, hopefully, we get. And I, I will take you up on that offer. Yes, so, please. Watch out. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mother, too. Bye. Okay.